Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. So I learned that we've got a local company that has done some really cool stuff in space. Specifically, and I think I get this analogy correct, it's like an invisible extension cord to space. And uh, they entered into a contest, a NASA contest. First time, didn't do it. Second time, you got it. Uh, and now, uh, basically, he, he gets to live out his dreams of, uh, you know, living in space vicariously, so to speak. Or I guess this company, a local company, uh, Laser Motive, and uh, on their behalf is Tom Nugent. So, Tom, please. Thanks. Great. Yeah, I think when we say invisible extension cord to space, you have to say it, to space. <laughs> Let me get my crap out of the way here. So uh, my company is Laser Motive. We are uh, down in Kent, for those of you who are local. And uh, we won a NASA technology competition back in November. And I'll talk a little bit about that and uh, what all we're, we're doing in hopefully a very brief time. And if I go too fast, I apologize. I want to save at least a few minutes for questions. So I'm going to talk about space and dreams and going into this competition and, and what we're going to be doing in the future. So ignore that. Um, back in the 1960s and 1970s, you know, people were really excited about Apollo and going to the moon and all this cool stuff you could do in space. And there were these, these visionaries uh, like Gerard O'Neill and uh, Peter Glazer who had all these amazing ideas of things you could do once you had lots of people in space. You could make colonies. There were just big, giant things that could house a million people you know, in orbit. Um, you could put up these farms of solar collectors and collect limitless, pollution-free energy and beam it back down to the Earth and, and deal with our energy problems. And these ideas were you know, studied by NASA, got a lot of people sort of excited about space. And if, if you're in sort of space enthusiast community, you've probably heard about some of these ideas. And I sort of came across them once I was in college, um, very early 90s. And I got so excited, like, wow, great. I want to I wanna, you know, study engineering and, and make these things happen. And I, you know, I sort of joined a local chapter of this National Space Society and, and ran it. And we won recruitment awards and did all this great stuff. And of course, I was young, and I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And eventually, you know, reality hit. And everyone who's, who's trying to do stuff in space realizes that there is this, uh, this sort of chicken and egg problem. People have lots of ideas of what kinds of cool stuff you might be able to do if you were to go into space. Uh, but to do that, it needs to be cheap. And right now, it costs, um, what is it, somewhere between five and $10,000 per kilogram, you know, two and a half to $5,000 per pound to put something into space. And that just makes it uneconomical for almost anything you want to do. And so there's this question of, well, people talk about ways to make it cheaper to get to space, but do you first get this market that would make you lots of money if you had you know, cheap, reliable, high-capacity launch services? Or do you make cheap, reliable, high-capacity launch services because you're going to find out what these markets are. You can't get the money to build the launch services until you have the money from the markets. So I, I spent a lot of my time trying to figure out how do you break this, this, this vicious cycle and, and make it so that you can start doing cool stuff in space. And I talk about you know collecting energy from space and stuff, but once you can send you know a thousand times uh, the amount of material to space per year that we're doing right now, people will be doing all sorts of things you can't even think about. Just like, you know, Twitter. When, when DARPA sort of first made the internet 40 years ago, they weren't thinking about Twitter. Um, but it's just one of those things that comes out. Once you have that ability, who knows what's going to come from it. So one of the things I spent some time working on as a sort of a way to make it cheaper to get to space uh, was a space elevator. I actually worked with a company that was based here in Seattle called Liftport and tried to figure out all the different aspects of, of building this thing, which if you haven't heard about it, Space Elevator is this 62,000 mile ribbon that has one end on the ground, anchored, and the other end is out in space, and it's just sort of like you know a ball on the end of a string that you spin around. There's tension in that string from spinning it, 
and you could climb this ribbon up into space. And it would be, you know, space elevators sort of like a bridge into space instead of taking a boat across the sound. Um, it, it can be higher throughput, it can be low cost, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I spent some time looking on it and for a variety of reasons came to the conclusion that it wasn't gonna happen on Earth in my lifetime. You know, maybe you could build one on the moon or Mars because they have a shallower gravity well. Um, and eventually on Earth, um, once a bunch of other stuff happens, but uh, you know, I didn't want to work on something that was going to happen in 100 years. I wanted to make a difference sooner than that. And so I eventually got interested in this whole laser thing. About the same time, there was all this publicity and excitement about the space elevator idea, which had been uh, revived because of materials developments. Um, NASA was inspired, uh, or some might say shamed, by the X Prize, which was this competition um, privately funded to have a totally uh, non-government uh, body, private company, to launch a suborbital rocket twice within two weeks. Uh, and it was one, and I'm sure you've all heard of uh, Virgin Galactic and their suborbital flights that they're gonna be offering in another year or two. So NASA decided, well, you know, these technology prizes, they have this big long history going back hundreds of years and generally people spend in aggregate more money trying to win the prize than the amount of prize money is available. So it's a great return for us if we want some technology. And there was an organization called Space Sword that really wanted to uh, develop a space elevator. They thought it was great. And they were trying to set up prizes. NASA said, hey, we're looking to put out some prize money to run prizes. And Space World was the first organization that said, yeah, we'll run it. So they partnered with NASA and had this, this prize, two of them actually, one for the materials, to get stronger materials you would need, and one for power beaming, which is how people envisioned taking your, your vehicle and having it climb this ribbon 62,000 miles into space, because you don't want to carry your fuel with you. So I'm gonna step back for a second, and there's a couple threads I'm trying to, to weave together here. Uh, power beaming itself was, was done on a certain scale back in the 60s and 70s, and people originally thought, we're gonna use microwaves, because there are certain wavelengths that are uh, transparent through the entire atmosphere. You can beam power right through clouds, it, it doesn't even stop it at all. Um, but the problem is you needed these big, giant, massive antennas and receivers, and if you're gonna have to launch something that big, it's gonna be really expensive, and so it would never get off the ground. Then people said, well, hey, you could do it with lasers. You can get much smaller antennas and stuff. But originally, lasers were really inefficient and they were expensive. Uh, but lasers have been getting cheaper and cheaper. Uh, one specific kind called diode lasers are used a lot. And it's really funny. We, as a company that's working with lasers, benefit from vanity. Um, laser hair removal for example, is one market that drives the development of diode lasers. So people getting laser hair removal have pushed down the cost of diode lasers so that we can use it to do um, cooler stuff. So back in 2006, I met uh, Jordan Kerr, who's uh, locally here. He's a uh, big uh, laser expert, has been trying to do laser power beaming for 30 years, done some great experiments. And we said, you know, this technology is getting to the point where lasers are cheaper, they're more powerful, you might actually be able to make a company doing it. NASA had just been running this power beaming competition for a year or two, we went and checked it out, and we saw people with you know, spotlights steering them by hand, and we're like, you know, someone with a stage spotlight steering them by hand is not the level of technology that NASA is really looking for in, in a technology prize. We've got to use lasers because they're cool and because they, they, they work better, um, and we have, to, we have to do this right. So we uh, formed a team, that was going to use this competition to uh, sort of get money from the prize and publicity, um, but it was going, excuse me, um, it, it was going to be a stepping stone to, to bigger things. And actually, let me back up one second. One of the things that people had also done with power beaming, I forgot to mention, is not only sort of transmitting energy um, for electrical use, but people had also talked about using it to uh, launch rockets, to launch vehicles. And so in my 
point of view, when I sort of came across this, this whole power beaming idea and looked at starting a company, here was something that could attack sort of both halves of that chicken and egg problem. You know, if you can work on something that might change how you get into space, that could have a great impact. If you change something that might collect energy and beam it down to Earth and help with energy problems, that's a market. That's the other half of, of this, this sort of uh, Gordian knot problem of, of getting into space. So this was sort of, for me, a great way of going from where I'd been back in college of this you know, clueless uh, but enthusiastic uh, kid who wanted to do stuff in space. Here was actually a path now to maybe having an impact and making it uh, possible to get into space. So very quickly, in 2007, we had 10 months. We got together a team. We put together this whole technology. Um, you can sort of see, you know, this is really dark on the screen, but we built this big 10 kilowatt uh, laser system. We uh, built a uh, solar specialized solar cell receiver. We built this climber, and um, we failed. But that's OK, because everyone else did too, so the prize money was still there. Um, 10 months was just not enough time to sort of take and build this entire complicated system and uh, try and, and make a, a working uh, thing that was going to be reliable. We, uh, we had it working, and then we, we broke it by trying to improve it, which was a mistake. Um, you can sort of see in the, the corner here, there's an inset picture. In 07, the competition was held uh, near Salt Lake City at some county fairgrounds. And because it was not that far from uh, residential areas, and because we were using uh, high-powered lasers, which are an eye hazard, we had this big curtain around our, our base station. And so we're inside this curtain, getting set up, literally at midnight, in the rain, trying to get our laser and our optics out there in the rain to, to work. And uh, everyone else is you know, a few hundred feet away, just seeing this, this black curtain. And the diode lasers happen to be uh, very electrostatic sensitive, sort of like the, the RAM in your computer. So when you're not using them, you put a shorting wire across them to protect them. Well, in all the, the chaos and the confusion at midnight, um, we forgot to take off one of the, the shorting wires. And when you run 90 amps through a very fine gauge wire, um, you get a whole bunch of smoke, which is the insulation vaporizing. So, <laughs> so we're there, and we hear this pop. And we see the smoke, like, oh, oops, take the remains of the wire off and go on. Everyone else standing outside doesn't know what's going on. They see this puff of smoke come out, and it, it looks very big in this, this shot. And they're wondering what horrible things have been happening inside there. Um, but one of the things we learned from this is the importance of testing. And we'd sort of known it intellectually. We just didn't have time to do it. But we, we sort of got hit with it you know, right in the gut that you need lots and lots and lots of time to test and test and redesign and rebuild and retest and, and do it some more. And we took that to heart for the next time uh, that we went back for the competition. Each year this competition was run, they kept making it harder and harder because they'd had this roadmap set out from the beginning and teams were doing good enough, even though they weren't quite meeting the requirements for winning, they kept making it higher and higher and you had to go faster and faster. Um, I guess I haven't actually explained what the competition was. You had to have this little robot vehicle that would climb a vertical cable powered by nothing but the power you're transmitting from the ground. And so they decided to go from 300 feet to 3,000 feet for the next time they ran it. Uh, this was a, a, an altitude of one kilometer, and they had two prize levels going at two meters per second uh, or five meters per second. And the problem they have with that is when you're at 300 feet, you can actually find cranes tall enough to hang a cable from. There are no cranes that go up to uh, three or 4,000 feet. Uh, and in fact, it's very hard to find any natural features you can even hang a cable from, because um, you need it to go vertical. So they eventually were looking at maybe balloons, and that was expensive, because when you need to fill a four-story building with helium, that, that costs a lot, and eventually settled on helicopters. The helicopter was also expensive, but not as expensive as the helium. And so they got it set up at the dry lake bed uh, out in Edwards Air Force Base where you didn't have to worry about spectators and, and laser safety and stuff like that. Here's the uh, eight of our team members who are actually there for the 09 competition. Uh, we have about 12 active members at any time. And this, I'll talk about this more later, but you know, the team is what really defines us. We're, we're working on cool technology, but 
you know, we have here a, a group of people who have very diverse skills, diverse ranges, uh, diverse ages, uh, a very wide range of experiences. And this is a group that after being, you know, going months uh, without enough sleep, sleep deprivation, working at 2 a.m. trying to get stuff ready, are still joking around and having fun. And that's just a, a very special thing, that we have a, a great group of people who, who really work well together. Uh, and we have lots of great sponsors who also helped us with uh, hardware uh, discounts and things like that. And people look at this and say, okay, yeah, laser company, we got a discount. Boeing, yeah, they do high tech, but why is REI one of your sponsors? You know, <laughs> what do they give you? And it turns out that, remember I said testing and testing and testing some more? Well, they have a pinnacle at their downtown store that people do rock climbing on. They let us hang a cable from that and we could uh, battery power our little vehicle to climb up uh, 90 or 100 feet and uh, did it very fast. So lasers, um, I won't go into much of this, but something about smaller than your pinky finger can put out from that three horsepower of light, uh, which is sort of hard to, uh, to grasp, but it's just amazing how much power you can get out of little tiny uh, package in lasers these days. Um, that's the inside. Here's the optics. So this is one of the things that's weird about lasers. We use a near-infrared wavelength that people cannot see. It's just outside quite what our, our eyes are sensitive to. Um, but the sensors in your cameras are sensitive to it. Uh, so if you have a cell phone or a, a cheap consumer camera, you can see it. And the, the beam shows up sort of purplish or pinkish, depending on color balance or stuff. But if you've got a really high quality, great camera, you can't see it because it's got uh, color filters uh, built in to make great, good color for you to see and filters out the infrared stuff. Um, one of the requirements for this competition is you got to take this laser beam and you have to keep it on the receiver. You have to track it around. In 07, we had a, a computerized system that would automatically, using uh, machine vision, keep the beam on there. And for a variety of reasons, we didn't think we could improve that system to be ready in time when we had to go from 100 meters to a kilometer. And so we actually wound up having a, a manually tracked system. And oddly enough, it was the youngest guy on the team who was best at the video game. I, I, uh, so yes, uh, a guy named Nick played and won the $900,000 video game. Um, we had everything in a trailer. This is the climber. This is, this is the thing that gets on the cable and moves. So this is the part that everyone focuses on, even though most of the stuff in here is relevant only to the competition and not to other things you would be doing with power beaming. Um, one of the guys named the climber Otis because it was a space elevator. Um, you, yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, late nights. Uh, the stuff down here is sort of a launching platform. They, you put it on the cable, they pull the cable up, and you start off high in the sky, and you have a, a platform that sort of clamps onto the cable, and you take off from there. And we had all sorts of weird stuff in this climber. We had um, space-grade solar cells made uh, from a specialized material. We also had skateboard wheels. You can see over here, the wheels we actually used to, to grip and climb it were skateboard wheels that we turned down. We had wires from your toaster that we used to uh, dump heat into for uh, uh, braking when we were coming back down. Uh, we had a motor controller that came out of a uh, Bradley fighting vehicle. So it was this very odd mix of stuff we sort of made ourselves and, and off-the-shelf items that got repurposed. Uh, and part of our secret sauce is something we do to the photovoltaic array to make it keep, uh, maintain efficiency even when it's not evenly illuminated. Uh, we had a 14-foot box truck that we had our whole command center in. Um, the displays here for the pilot and co-pilot, the laser operator. Because, for safety reasons, you had to be buttoned up inside your truck, we had some security cameras outside to see what was going on. And we had eight people crammed into this 14-foot box truck that had this command center and work table and shelves and stuff, so it was uh, cozy, is the best way to, uh, to put it. Um, there we are at REI. Uh, there's the, the certificate that Otis won for climbing the pinnacle. Um, and here's a test setup we have in our, our shop. I, I can't say enough about testing. And you can't just sort of go outside and, and hang a cable a kilometer into the sky anytime you want. So we built this vertical treadmill that had a, a 
cable that ran around, and we would mount the climber onto it and just run it. And it would drive a kilometer or two. And in fact, we could put a mirror under it, shine the laser, and do a laser-powered climb for a kilometer in our shop. And you can see up there, there's a nice big house fan you bought at Home Depot to simulate the airflow. Um, and the house fan is, is sort of uh, one indication of how we were able to do all this stuff on what was relatively a, a shoestring budget. Lasers, they cost some money. Voltaics cost some, but there's a lot of very useful hardware you can get for the cheap from eBay, uh, industrial auction sites, and uh, a lot of other places if you know where to look. Um, and we had fun while we were testing. One time you had to test the optics to make sure they were okay with the high laser intensity, but we weren't doing anything with the beam after they went through the optics, so we cooked some hot dogs. And you know, there's, there's Steve sitting behind the safety sign. He's holding the hot dogs out in the beam and turning them. And, you know, this is, it, it's funny, you know, the hot dogs tasted great, by the way. Um, the, the thing I, I like about this is that people hear the word laser and they think death ray. And it's like, well, you know, we cooked hot dogs, but it took four minutes to cook them right. So that's about what you would do in your, your oven. So for the laser stuff we're working with, it's like very dangerous to your eyes, no question about that. But your skin, it's like, ow, that hurts. Ooh, ow, that hurts. It's not going to vaporize you or something. So we're not working with death rays here. Um, at the competition, it was very dusty. We didn't want the dust on our optics, so I was half-jokingly trying to vacuum the entire desert floor. Uh, it's a, a very fine, like, flower-like powder dust, and it was getting everywhere. Uh, there we are in the command center, and, um, of course, you do the drill press work in your hotel room at night, then clean, clean up all the aluminum shavings so that housekeeping doesn't get upset. And here is the video of our first climb, the one that put us in the money. So there we are on the launch platform. You can tell from here that that's sort of a, a good speed that it takes off at. We're sitting almost directly underneath it, and we just see it slowly getting slightly smaller and moving, so we can't actually tell visually what it's doing. It's four minutes, so I sped it up. And of course, elevator music, because it's the space elevator games. Thank you. So this is a four, just about four minute climb. Here we are near the end, still going. You know, we'd been working on this for three years. Our breath, you know, our, our hearts were in our throats, wondering if it was gonna make it. And we go up and hit our top stop. That tells us we're at the top, comes back down, and oh, let's go do it again. That was actually not us purposely being cocky or anything. That was actually an accident. We had a remote control to, if we needed to, tell it to come down or something. And uh, the guy who had it actually fumbled the thing to reset it into the climb state. We hadn't turned the laser off, because if you turn the laser off, you lose, unless you've made it to the top. So we weren't going to turn that laser off until we knew we were there. So it still had a little bit of power, and it, it screeched its brakes and turned reverse direction and climbed up and did it again. So... That was a kilometer. Uh, the, starting, the starting point was at 100 meters, and the, e the end point was at a kilometer. Um, so that was about uh, 3,300 feet away from, from where we were, straight up. Um, so we did two co runs, totally consistent the first day. Didn't make the uh, five meters per second that we wanted to. Uh, at 3.8 meters per second, we were in the money. We made level one, two meters per second, $900,000. So we were so relieved, it was amazing. But we wanted to get the whole thing. There's another $1.1 million if you made five meters per second. Come back the next day, two more runs. We'd taken off a little bit of weight, uh, changed our optics a bit, and got a little bit faster, but we still weren't there. So Thursday night, we gave it a diet, and that climber vehicle lost 18% of its weight overnight. Um, we took off basically protective systems, safety systems, sensors, and risked breaking the whole thing just to try and make it uh, faster. Um, this would have worked if we hadn't had absolutely no sleep that night taking it off and forgot to replace the, the what we now call million dollar nut. Um, 
when we sit on the launch platform, everything has to just slide onto the cable. And so there's a, a, a slit, slit in this uh, uh, bottom launch platform. And the uh, spike sticking out of the bottom of the vehicle has a nut on it to keep it from sliding into that slot, and you can guess what's going on. The spike fell into there, and now when we started taking off, instead of being a drag race, it was a tractor pull. We had a friction clamp uh, with its own mass clamped on the cable. We dragged it 75 feet up the cable at six meters per second um, until the climber broke free of it and then had way too much laser power on it and overwhelmed the... Uh, DC converter we had on board and blew up. Each, of, each day you get one 45 minute window to go up and down as often as you can. We brought this thing down, landed the, the vehicle, found out what the problem was, got out there, took off the bad part, put on a new one and went back up for another climb all in 10 minutes, which is it, just amazing if, if you haven't seen what the environment is like. But the replacement was bad too, so we blew that up. So we didn't make the, uh, the money uh, for the higher level prize, but we did come back with $900,000, which was the first time anyone had ever actually made the minimum amount, the, the minimum qualifications to, to win some of the prize money in, I believe, the fourth time they'd hold, held this competition. Um, yeah, we beat up our parts, because when you're doing a drag race, you're not designing something for 10,000 hour lifetime. If any part is surviving more than a couple hours, you haven't been pushing your design hard enough. Um, and the, the biggest thing about this is that when you're looking to take a technology and put it in, say, a space mission or, or a military mission, that technology has to advance to a certain point before they'll consider uh, using it. And NASA and the DOD have a scale from one to nine of how ready a technology is. And they want things to be like you know, five or six, at least before they'll think about putting it into a, a, a mission. And by doing what we did at this competition, we brought that technology from, say, four to six. And we're actually close to doing it to seven. And so that's really important because it means people can now look at using this technology in a real mission. Um, and when people think about remote power, they think about things inside a, a room or, or in your house, and that's you know something to, to light a light bulb or turn on your computer. We're doing a lot bigger power. This is we got a kilowatt out at that receiver uh, at one point. So we were told that the competition next round was going to be in May of 2010, and it didn't happen, and it was going to be in October of 2010, and now that's slipped, and now we don't know where it is. But we've been focusing on getting our our optics better, our vehicle better, our tracking is now automated, and here's a shot we got with uh, uh, when we were doing some publicity work of the laser beams, and people think you know really tiny beam is what a laser beam is like. This big, thick thing here is, is what our laser beam looks like. And uh, normally you can't see it in the air unless you put a bunch of smoke in there like we did. So we're ready for the next round of this NASA competition, but they uh, haven't been able to get it organized yet. So now, let me briefly talk about why we're doing all this stuff. I mean, winning a, a NASA technology competition, bringing home some money is great, but you know, we, we had uh, a dozen guys or more trying to uh, work nights and weekends for three years, and I think after you distribute all the prize money and pay the taxes, people got about $10 an hour for, uh, for all their time, which, you know, it's more than minimum wage, but um, it's not what engineers can make. So uh, the real reason to do this is for all the stuff we want to do in the future. And I, I don't know how to, how to really get this point across, but in my mind, people who are interested in doing stuff in space often look at the end game and start there. Uh, they want to go and build a giant, massive power station in orbit uh, and don't look at all the steps you need to do beforehand. So in my mind, what Laser Motive is doing is starting at commercial markets for power beaming that you can go out and do today and that you can make money at to bring in revenue and keep your company growing. And you can start expanding the envelope of what you're doing so that you can eventually make it to all these cool later stuff. So the, the blue is what we did for the competition. This is distance and, and power. And there's things you can do, for example, with unmanned aerial vehicles, like the drones that the military uses. And eventually you can get to, to the bigger stuff. So I mentioned these, these uh, drones, these flying vehicles. Number one demand by the guys who use these out in the field is we need more endurance. They want to stay up in the air longer. Can't run an extension cord up there, but with power beaming, you can take this invisible extension cord, run it up, and have these things fly indefinitely. Um, 
some people you know, aren't all that wild about doing stuff for the military, but there's a lot of other applications. Um, disaster relief. When the earthquake struck Haiti a couple of years ago, they had all sorts of problems. The roads were, were totally torn up, and it was hard to get generators into the city. You could have a very light receiver, someone could carry it on the back, set it up, and now you could very quickly beam power into an earthquake-stricken city and get communications going. You could power field hospitals, all sorts of stuff that you would be delayed in doing if you had to rely on generators or things like that. Um, and here's one of the, the coolest dreams, is what if you could launch rockets with lasers? And what we specifically mean is when the way rockets work today is you take a, a fluid and you heat it up and you expand it out a nozzle. The way you heat it up is you explode it. And people aren't all that happy having to sit on top of a giant pile of explosives while they're trying to get to space. You could use inert gas and heat it by laser. And then your laser, all your complicated, expensive, difficult to service parts stay on the ground. And we're working on an idea where you can do a demonstration using a very small system, close to what we've already built, and be able to demonstrate this whole idea for very little money and then scale it up and make 10,000 units. And now instead of making one big giant rocket that if one thing fails, you're dead, you have 10,000 units and if something fails, you don't care. You've lost 0.01% of your power. And so we're trying to do a lot of work in getting some interest in using rock lasers to launch rockets into space. And then there's sort of this, this thing that started it all back in, in the late 60s was, what if it were economical to collect solar energy in space and beam it down to Earth 24-7 all the time and get some great power? I don't know if that will ever be economically possible, but by doing the steps we're doing today with, with UAVs and, and disaster relief and stuff, we are trying to get the technology, the regulatory framework, and the familiarity with this technology to the point where we could actually do that. So I'm going to end again with my team, because we have a great group of people, and we are trying to take these, these dreams of space and have fun for the next couple of decades trying to make a business that's going to get there to those uh, space dreams. Thank you. Uh, there's a really interesting gentleman who's interested in space. Uh, uh, Mr. Branson said that in order to become a millionaire, start off as a billionaire and then try and make a space travel company. Right. Do you the think the same thing tr is true of airlines, I've heard. Yeah. Do you think that's true for the effort you're working on? I won't know until we get there. <laughs> um, the, the, the problem with, with uh, trying to launch stuff into space is that right now there is one market, communication, um, communications and surveillance satellites, and they have a very inelastic demand curve. Uh, until you do something that makes it less expensive, um, you won't know what all those other markets are that can make you a real business. So they say the same thing about airlines. You know, if you want to make a, lot, a million dollars building an airline, start with a billion dollars. But there's still a whole bunch of airlines in business right now. So uh, there's still a lot of rocket companies. So while it is very difficult, um, things are changing, for example, with SpaceX and what, what Elon Musk is doing. Uh, and it'll be very interesting to see how that turns out to change sort of how rocket launch works. You have um, that graph up there of power to distance. There's a third component there of cost. Is it linear? Is it ex exponential as you go more power? Or? It's, uh, it's roughly linear with power. Um, it's basically a modular unit. You want twice the power, build a second unit. Um, with distance, it's uh, hard to quantify. It, um, it's not exactly linear, but uh, it, it gets more expensive as you go to longer distance. No, no. Well, it's sort of like there's some steps. The technology we use is good out to maybe 10 kilometers. If you want to get further than that, you'd have to use a different laser technology that's more expensive but less efficient. So like a lot of technologies, there's a peaceful and obviously, in this case, a very scary wartime use for, say, power beaming back to Earth. What could we do to limit that other than wearing tinfoil hats? <laughs> <laughs> so um, Jordan Kerr, my co-founder, and some people he's worked with have done designs. Um, a fundamental thing in optics is how tightly you can focus your beam depends uh, on the size of your biggest lens or mirror. Um, 
you know, if I take a laser pointer that has a nice tiny beam here and I point it at the moon, it's going to be, you know, as big as the moon or something by the time it gets there. And so you can actually design systems where your optics are just a certain size. And so down on the ground, you could get something that might be, say, two or three times the intensity of the sun. It could be hot, it would be uncomfortable, but it wouldn't burn stuff. And so no matter what you do, because the mirror you've got up in space is a certain size, that would just limit it so that you can't actually ever make it into a real weapon. Great, thank you very much.